Okay, so we just want to kind of step through for you what uh, what we provided to FirstNet on September 30th. Um, they had required a pretty comprehensive data collection, um, and the intent there is that all of this content will go into the draft or the, the a final RFP that they expect to be published on December 31st. We'll know the second week of December if the board's going to approve publishing it. Um, we're thinking they probably will because they may want to be able to say that they published it in 2015. So um, <laughs> we'll step through the timelines quickly in our submission and then uh, some information on the coverage specifications, phases of deployment, depth of coverage, some survey results and demand forecasting, and then the CAD data that was provided. So. And if you have any questions, just you know, let us know at any time. Uh, so, so uh, this is kind of just a quick timeline to FirstNet. Uh, as you see there, kind of the important things that we see coming up are release of the RFP, likely December 31st. Uh, they'll step through the full RFP process in early 2015, 2016, excuse me, and they uh, we expect that they'll request responses by May 31st. Then we expect the balance of 2016 to be um, the selection of the vendor and potentially start into contract negotiations. Uh, FirstNet has said publicly that they hope to provide state plans to all of the states and territories starting um, second quarter of 2017. We're curious to see if that plays out. Uh, and they now have said, they've changed their story a couple times, but they said most recently that they expect to publish all state plans, 56 of them, or 55 of them at once. So um, we'll keep you guys posted as that timeline changes. Is, is uh, that a realistic yeah. timeline? Go ahead. I said, is that, do you think that's a realistic timeline? I, uh, I mean, if they're, if, <laughs> if they're only negotiating a contract towards the end of 2016, um, I would be hard to think that they'd have a designed for Colorado that early in 2017. Just my we thought. agree. We think we would be surprised. Um, the one way we think they would do it is if they're literally going to cookie cutter every state plan, which then, you know, gives us pause for concern about whether they're really um, assessing what the needs of each state and territory are and providing a plan that meets those needs. So okay. To your point. Yeah. So the next, this just gives you um, mapping information as it requested to, um, or we mapped the information based on how they wanted the deliverables. So um, there was a number of spreadsheets that they had us fill out. Uh, we did the survey that you guys participated in. We asked for CAD data, mapping data when available. And then we mapped um, coverage objectives based on a number of data sets we'll show you. And then the demand forecast, which were uh, those conversations that occurred over multiple sessions with different users. Um, just gives you an idea of where we, how or where we responded to um, their request. And then uh, kind of the four big buckets of uh, data that we provided to them. And on the right-hand side, I won't go through all of those, but it gives you an idea of the depth of data we provided them around coverage specification and phases, our CAD incident data, uh, the survey results, and the demand forecast. We were able to geotag about 2.2 million CAD incidents as a data set, um, which we know actually was probably small um, because there were a lot of locations we couldn't, um, you know, give a latitude and longitude point. We had about 150 public safety entities, which we think represents about a 10% response rate, um, but we think it gave us good data and we'll show you how we kind of forecasted using that data and some other data. And then the coverage specifications were a number of data sets we'll step through. Uh, kind of a funny story is when we saw FirstNet in October, they said that um, they received eight gigs of data across the country, but that we know we gave them one gig alone for Colorado. So Colorado potentially was probably the most comprehensive response they received. Uh, and these are two more uh, the operational areas. When we had them, agencies provided their jurisdictional boundaries, or we had them through some GIS work done here at the state, and then a cover letter. So I want to step through quickly the coverage specification, um, how we came up with it, so you understand uh, our methodology and how we believe it's entirely factual. Um, 
Go ahead. So this is a map showing elevation of Colorado from dark green, uh, lower elevation to the white, which represents kind of the peaks of the mountains. And then uh, we step through the morph we'll step through the morphology. Uh, dense urban is red. Um, I got it. Thanks. Urban is orange. Suburban, yellow. Rural cluttered green and rural open blue. Uh, the difference between rural cluttered is really those areas where it, we consider it rural in Colorado, but we know there's population versus rural open, where generally population doesn't reside or habitate in that location, but they might visit it. And so this next map represents the morphologies of how we think Colorado needs to be covered. Largely, it's rural open, but you'll see um, along the front range, certainly there's the dense urban, urban and suburban and then the rural uh, cluttered locations, which are sporadically through, um, you know, pretty much every county in the state, but uh, representative of the fact that largely Colorado is open space. Population is everywhere, but uh, not living everywhere. So the data sources we used for this uh, coverage objectives process um, first came from FirstNet. They provided five separate data sources um, that resulted in a map that we'll show you later on that we, and you've probably seen before, we consider highly inadequate with regard to um, what FirstNet proposed to potentially put in their RFP and then a bidder would respond to. So we took their initial data sets, which were high risk areas. We believe these represent critical infrastructure and maybe other um, areas through the HSIP, uh, the Homeland Security Infrastructure Protection mapping or GIS program, you know, that might be classified as, as critical or um, important infrastructure in a, in a state. We, we looked at develop areas through the um, National League of Cities data. We, uh, and again, this is all came from FirstNet2, um, census data from them. And the interesting thing about even though they had all this data, they didn't necessarily propose, propose coverage where all of the data represents uh, potentially the need for coverage highways and traffic counts, and then railroads. And uh, there was a transit piece, which we think probably, if you skip to the next one, represents um, just the light rail, because we know it's not representative of the entire RTD district or any other transit that might be working in the state, too. So now we're going to step through the data that we, uh, additional data sets that we use to inform our, CAD, our coverage. Um, one thing to understand about kind of how we went about doing the coverage is the state was broken up to one by one mile grids. And essentially, when you see the coverage map later on, if there was any data point that landed in one of those one by one mile grids, we turned that grid on and um, required that coverage be met for that entire one by one square mile in the area, not just the point within the grid. So does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Just um, so we, I, real quick, since I mainly reside or live in Denver world, um, I know some of our size of our surrounding counties. How many square miles is the state of Colorado? I think it's like 450,000, I want to say. Okay. Uh, let me, then, actually, I can just look real quick. You know, Denver's county is fairly small from a, a county perspective. That's why I was kind of curious. Actually, I said that wrong. It's 104,000 square miles. I don't know where I got. Oh, I don't know where I got 400,000 square. It's 104,000 square miles. So I I crossed my numbers. Okay. Yeah. And Denver is 154 square miles. 155 square miles. So. Right. Not not in counting. Not counting the airport. Right. Yep. So we had about a 46% response rate from the PSAPs in the state, and we'll step through the CAD data at the very end, but we actually felt like this gave us a good opportunity to kind of turn on some of the areas that may not have um, come through with other data sets. This is representative of generally one year of CAD data um, in a given jurisdiction, and uh, um, provided generally with no concern from about half of the PSAPs in the state. We are willing to continue to take information from PSAPs. I have been working with um, Denver 
And he provided me map data, but I still am waiting for their PSEP data. But, you know, in your area, your, your PSEP data is really going to help us look at the capacity issues. Obviously, coverage will be kind of be um, a moot point. So. Uh, we looked at recreation areas. This would be data from state parks and wildlife, national recreation areas, and any other um, recreation areas that might come from county sources, too. We looked again at a different data set from tra transportation infrastructure. And then we looked at a more comprehensive view of the national, state, and county roads. We didn't just want to take state highways. We wanted to look at all county roads that might be um, covered within a jurisdiction. We also looked at um, the intersection of DTR coverage um, in, um, you know, talk in and talk out. Um, we will qualify that, you know, we know this is not representative of all of the systems. And if there, if you guys have coverage maps that you want to provide us, um, it was really a one shot to get data quickly. We knew largely, again, the metro area would be covered by DTR, and we were looking to get a footprint across the state as well. Uh, this is portable DTR coverage on the next map. Um, is the intersection of the mobile DTR coverage. So what we concluded, um, well, we concluded that this, this map that FirstNet provided was really inadequate, as you can see. Um, and they, they told us that if we did not respond, this is what would go in the RFP. So we knew that that couldn't be, um, that we wouldn't be doing that. It represented 97% of the population, but only 24% of the area, just as a quick note. When we did a composite of all of the Colorado data sources, this is what we came up with as a proposed terrestrial coverage map for FirstNet. Now, we know this might be a pie-in-the-sky kind of view of it, uh, but we do believe that it is factually representative of where we think responders will need coverage. Uh, this is what we'd like to see at the end of the first net process. It's not what we're proposing to see day one. Um, and then we also want to qualify that those areas that lack coverage could be covered by deployables, but that we will be going back to the jurisdictions to kind of look granularly at those areas to ensure that we don't need to propose some sort of terrestrial coverage as well, um, depending on, you know, if we look and there's a road or a town or uh, hopefully that wouldn't have happened or if there's, um, you know, they know that they tend to have problems with incidents in that area because it's a highly um, traversed hiking trail or something like that. And then this is the base coverage specification. So if you look through it, um, it's broken down by county and then we propose three phases of coverage to FirstNet and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but it shows you essentially how, what percentage of geography of the county might be covered in a three-phased approach uh, in Denver. So in Denver, it's 10.5%, and I'll explain that to you <laughs> in just a minute when we get through that. But at phase two, it would be 100%, and phase three, it would be 100%. So, so this is the difference between what FirstNet proposed and what, um, what we came up with uh, in our data set and analysis. And then based on the surveys that were completed by the agencies, we do believe that coverage, you know, our, our uh, kind of comprehensive coverage map is justified um, with a 76% re response rate that coverage was the most important unmet need in a data network. So, so the phases of deployment. Uh, in the phases of deployment, we actually um, came up with three phases. FirstNet proposed five phases, but we believe, you know, since commercial carriers can deploy in 18 to 24 months, that five phases was kind of unacceptable. We have talked with FirstNet since, and they did not push back on our three-phased approach, which we kind of were surprised about, and we're pleased they didn't push back. So we have every reason to believe that our Colorado's portion of the RFP will reflect a request for a three-phase versus five-phase approach. We'll just have to wait and see. Um, so phase one, if you see on the upper left, it describes the national, uh, or what it includes, uh, national, state, and county roads, uh, incidents, recreation areas, and limited deployment in dense urban, urban, and suburban areas. And uh, hopefully I do a decent job of explaining this. Randy uh, Looning, I think, does a better job. But the reason why we actually focused on more of a rural deployment in phase one is because when FirstNet partners with a carrier, you know, an AT&T or Verizon, 
We expect that that carrier, in order to get the immediate benefit of the band 14 um, revenues, you know, from deploying it commercially as well, they are already going to be deploying in the urban areas band 14. So by virtue of that, you guys are immediately going to be receivers of that or the benefit of that network. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that that's kind of um, that's our that's our bet. You know, we're take, we'll we'll see if it ends up that way. We do have, if you see on bullet number three, public gathering areas. We um, we do want to see. Um, some really dense deployments in stadiums, concert hall, airports, parade routes, et cetera. And then we'll certainly work with you guys as we begin stepping through that process of what that needs to look like. We also um, propose what we think is a decent deployable strategy across the state through the three phases. In the first phase, deployables with fuel sufficient um, for 72 hours, obviously you could continue to bring fuel in during that 72 hours but we'd want them deployed within, um, or the ability to be deployed within four hours anywhere in the state. We believe that represents about 45% of the sites that might be deployed in the first phase. The second phase is continued um, build out in the urban, dense urban, and suburban morphologies, additional areas, uh, including the high-risk areas, and then uh, really trying to cover that existing footprint of, L of LMR. Uh, and again, that LMR piece, we are willing to expand as we continue this negotiation with FirstNet, um, especially in those rural areas uh, like Clear Creek, Gilpin, Gunnison, some of those um, where they're hybrid users or they're largely VHF with DTR as a backup. We want to be able to represent that. Um, and we know we'll have time to do that in the process with, with the consultation and who FirstNet selects. Uh, and that second phase represents about, we think, 45% of the sites as well. So we think by the end of phase two, we should be at 90% of um, the sites that would cover the area we proposed. And then the deployable strategy is a response within the state within two hours. And then the last phase is additional sites needed to meet uh, full coverage. And we also believe that is the capacity or density issues that would need to be addressed in a um, urban area if they hadn't already been addressed by the carriers, they deploy band 14 for commercial use. And uh, we also want to see kind of an a la carte list of multiple types of deployables, vehicles, man packs, UAVs, um, and inexpensive deployables that could uh, we could train personnel to deploy potentially for a very rapid response. And I think that all remains to be seen on really as FirstNet develops its own deployable strategy. Any questions on the uh, phases of deployment? No. Okay. And here's uh, here's just a map representing those phases, which then correlates back to the percentages that showed on the previous slide. So we think um, even though you know Denver is largely white, again we have confidence that any carrier is going to be deploying in Denver first for commercial band 14 use. So by default, that area would be covered. Uh, next is phase two, and then. <clears throat> excuse me, phase three. So uh, we know that this is probably not going to be met, but we figure it's a, um, again, factual starting point from which we can negotiate down with FirstNet and whoever is selected. So the depth of coverage. Now I have to apologize because this is an area that Randy, again, um, covers much better. Oh, Randy, you're on the phone. So can I actually trouble you again to cover this? <laughs> what, would you like me to, to step through these uh, next few slides? If you don't mind, I, I've listened to your um, your conversation once, but if you, since you hopped on the line, I have Gary Pasnick with the City and County of Denver. Um, so I, I I think I would much rather have him benefit from your explanation than from mine, if you don't mind. Okay, sure, sure, sure. So so these uh, next, so basically there are two dimensions. Uh, to coverage, one is the geographic uh, footprint, and the other is you know, what we call either the depth or, or the or the quality of coverage, and 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 the latter is really um, you know what kind of performance do you get in increasingly um, harsh uh, environments, and so so what we've done is actually um, put together a, a dual requirement. Um, so, so one aspect of the requirement is that you have good uh, in-building coverage, and, and particularly in, um, in urban areas, th this ends up being a very, uh, a very strong re requirement. Um, and, and then 
secondarily, um, is a requirement for a, a configuration where you have a vehicle with a rooftop antenna. And this basically says that you've got, you know, 10 megabits uh, per second down and a megabit per second up on average over the county. And, and on the surface, if you look at those two requirements, you would think, well, the second is a much more robust service, uh, but actually it's the other way around. So if you get, uh, uh, you know, if you get the levels of in-building that we're specifying um, in a macrocellular network, then you'll, you'll actually have spectacular uh, performance. Um, part of the reason that we spec it this way is this is, uh, you know, the way a high quality uh, commercial operator would, would build in an urban area. And, and the thought is, you know, we shouldn't have a network that has any less performance. Um, it's also something that we think w is, is very much um, achievable by, uh, by, commercial, by, by the winning bidder because they'll almost certainly be building on the back of, of an existing commercial network. So anyway, so that's kind of, kind of an overview. And then, and then this is a way to, uh, this is a, a statistical view and, and a way to think about it. Um, so if you have, uh, for, for instance, um, a 90% a probability of uh, 640 kilobits per second on, on the, uh, um, in an in, in-building environment, then that actually translates into um, higher data rates uh, at, at lower probabilities in, in other types of, of venues. Um, so, so uh, for instance, um, here, even in, in building, um, your average data rate, if you look at the, the leftmost, if you look at the, the uh, blue bar, which is the, you know, the leftmost in the series of bars, on, on the, the rightmost clump of bars where it says 20, 20 megabits per second, uh, um, you can see that on average you're, you're getting better than that. So, so this is overall spectacular performance if, if the design meets the spec in the dense urban area. Um, and then if we just tumble through the next few pages, it'll, it'll, it shows by, by different um, morphologies. For instance, here in, in urban, you know, the same kind of dynamics. And, what, and the reason they're changing is the, um, the, the radio propagation uh, characteristics in, in each type of morphology change, but also um, as you go from very uh, dense urban to less dense, um, the, 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 uh, the building structure changes and, and you need less margins to get a good in-building in uh, signal. So anyway, this is a very complete um, specification. And then, and then um, let's see, the next, the next one, rural open, is, is, is actually the, the largest uh, geography of, of Colorado, um, but it really shows, um, you know, this shows that you have a very, uh, um, a very usable signal in, in a, a vehicular sense. Uh, but, you know, probably not as much uh, margin for in-building coverage in those areas, but that's okay because it's, it's, a, it's a huge area and if you can get a, a good consistent uh, signal across, you know, the entire geography, then that's, that's uh, way beyond what uh, FirstNet ha has proposed and, and will be very usable. Good. And then uh, this uh, uh, next section here um, basically goes through the, um, some of the results from the survey. And when we look at, at both the demand forecast, which we'll eventually, uh, we eventually put together um, in, in the survey, there are two, two different instruments to uh, basically uh, you know, figuring out what the future demand is going to be um, for FirstNet. So this particular slide um, looks at um, uh, data usage uh, uh, um, you know, per, per month in, 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 uh, uh, in, in gigabytes. Um, so you can see that the, the first responder usage is um, basically in line with, with the usage of, of, of different types of, of commercial users, which is, is interesting. You know, even though the, the purpose is very different, the usage levels are, are similar. And, and also the, uh, the cost of service. Um, you know, we looked at what people are paying uh, per, per device, you know, public safety entities, and, and it actually ends up being very similar to uh, nationwide uh, averages. And probably some of the factors that are, are at play is, is uh, you know, first responders are ch probably choosing the best service that they can buy, which is often, you know, the most expensive. Um, and at the same time, though, um, you know, there, there are some 
um, you know, discounts in terms of um, economies of scale and purchasing for an organization, uh, which would, would bring it down. But still, it, it, it would seem that there would be opportunities to, to further uh, reduce these numbers. And then um, a few things like this. This is a staffing ratio. So for every uh, person who is um, a first responder in, in one of the responding organizations, this, this shows what portion of, of, of that, that staff is full-time, part-time, volunteer, and then also shows the ratio of vehicles to people. And this is a fairly rich slide and, 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 and uh, pulls a bunch of information together. It basically shows um, almost all of the information on a per-person basis. So uh, on the left-hand column, um, you basically have um, 1.2 uh, 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 radios per, per, per person, um, and, and that breaks down into a, a portion, probably the largest portion, which is provided by the public safety entity um, to the individual, um, a smaller portion that is um, personally owned devices of the individual, and then finally uh, vehicle uh, installed devices, you know, provided by the PSC, um, which are, you know, when you allocate that out on a per person basis, contributes to the total. Um, so, so, the, uh, so, so the left bar really shows per person, and then, and then the, um, you know, the, most of the additional bars just show the, the breakdown and distribution, and again, for, on a per person basis, but, but the, um, you know, of, 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 um, of devices provided by the PSC, and those are individually owned, and then, and then um, we see here that, that, that we have um, the right rightmost bar. You got got 127% um, uh, of um, vehicle devices per per vehicle. So 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 anyway, it's the, the same same sets of data cut different ways. And then this doesn't have a lot of surprises, uh, but 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 we had a series of sections on applications. And this shows uh, that just gen general connectivity and, and communications and dispatch and, and database access and the things that you would tend to expect um, are actually just recorded as, as the most important. And, and this, this we could show a richer picture, but this I, I thought was useful just because it shows a, uh, in a very simple view of prior, prioritization. And then, and then uh, demand forecast. This is where we take some of the data from our survey, uh, plus a lot of secondary information, and we basically create a forward-looking view um, of you know, number of people, uh, uh, number of types of devices, um, um, usage per device, and then number of, of uh, public safety entities. And this changes over time and over location. So we have um, this, this, these uh, uh, KPIs recalculated for every year, and they're also projected uh, onto a county by county basis. So, so we've tried to cut the data in in as many ways as as, as would would be useful. And of, of course, it's uh, somewhat challenging because it's a forecast. But but you know, we, our our goal here has been to take all the available resources and be as as indicative as as possible uh, going forward. And so, so, so one question is, you know, when we ask, you know, who are the first responders? This was a question that was posed by uh, by FirstNet to um, j just to the first responder community at large, and um, the general response was um, that it includes a very broad category of parties. And so, what what we did is we uh, we started with um, a lot of the uh, um, national statistics that that, that are numbers that are reported nationally in terms of, of employment that, that could relate could relate to first responders and we um, we, we mapped it out and said what, what categories are most important and so here there are many that are are expected like you'll see uh, you know police and fire and, and corrections and, and uh, um, for instance health and hospitals would would, would capture uh, um, um, most of the emergency medical but you'll have you'll have a bunch of other People um, such as as uh, you know, natural resources or um, electrical power or or um, highways, you know, or air transportation that, that would 
be um, probably smaller stacks, but but would also have a critical need. And so, so in, in this analysis, we basically took a top-down approach um, to, to and then compared that with some of the very detailed data sets that we have for uh, um, you know for certain specific categories of responders. And this is a comparison here. So we we have a couple different data sets of of uh, uh, police, fire, and EMS, and, and as you can see, this this composite view um, arrives at a larger number of, of responders, which it should, although people uh, don't all use the network with the same intensity. And, and so here's a, here's a view of of just in terms of numbers of res responders. So you've got the category on the left, and then the the years going out, and, and here we forecast it through the end of the second uh, renewal period of FirstNet. And then, and then this is a snapshot uh, with the same data um, by county. And if you look at look at the way it adds up, it, it adds to the same numbers. So again, this is a view of numbers of human beings um, at this point, not devices or, or anything else was just to capture um, you know, wh where responders are. And, and in this case, what we did is we, we had a, a top-down view and then we correlated it to um, government employment by, by county. And so, so the good news is in a, in, a lar in a larger county, this should be very indicative. In a, very, in a, very, in a, in a county with a very small population, uh, it may be off, but, but actually the uh, excess capacity in the network will be huge there. And so, um, you know, we, we think either way it'll be um, uh, appropriate, you know, fine for, for, for planning purposes. And so this is sort of a, it's a challenging exercise to um, come up with this level of detail and to forecast it uh, in, into the very distant future. And then, and so here's, here's a bit more on, you know, number, uh, um, number of devices, uh, um, you know, in, given to people and, and vehicles, and this goes back to our our, 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 our research, and, and this, but this is, is here um, projected on onto this base, and then and then here here we have um, you know devices per person, and um, you know how many uh, voice and data and data only, and, and so what we've done here is we've taken a, essentially a, a combination of information that we've got in our research base. And we've also um, dimensioned it using uh, um, growth that we see in commercial markets. So, so one of the trends in, in commercial cellular is that the uh, number of devices per person is uh, growing year over year. And, and this is just because um, you know people get new tablets and other devices and machine to machine devices are, are emerging. And so, so we're, we're capturing, you know, it's a subtle effect, but we capture that, that forecast as part of this. And then, and then here, in terms of the um, usage, we've got um, you know this, this slide again in our, our forecast piece. And it, and so here we're we're, we're forecasting uh, gigabytes in minutes per use um, um, for each you know kind of on a, on a per device uh, basis. And, and we're showing how that's how that's uh, growing, and we're aggregating it, ag aggregating it across devices. So we're, we're getting a good view of just Essentially, the total load that the network will see in terms of, of both uh, voice and data. And finally, there was a, a discussion that we had on on uh, body cam video. And, and if you look at you know body cams today, you know in, in places where they're 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 used, and of course it's a, it's a rapidly changing environment. Uh, basically, everything. Um, that takes video and records it, you know, to, to some, some sort of of, of uh, localized memory device. Um, the view is, though, as 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 Ben 14 networks, you know, proliferate and 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 as technology evolves, at a certain point there will be an appetite for uh, um, you know, people to be able to, to stream um, body cam video video in real time. And, and some of this has been uh, envisioned by by Nipstick and uh, and others in specific uh, types of applications. But he, here we did a basically did, did an analysis, and we said if we took the entire base of, of first responders and we allowed for video streaming um, so many hours per day per first responder, um, what would be the the impact on on both the network load and, and the cost? 
And there are a couple things. One is um, it's very, very sensitive uh, to, to the quality of, of the data stream. And, um, and a high quality st uh, stream here is about, has about 20 times the data rate of a, of a lower quality stream. So, so big impact there. And, 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 um, so, and also in, in terms of cost, at, at the very low end, it's something that could be um, you know, captured even in, in our forecast usage um, at very light levels. If it were used very heavily, you know, this is the one application that could um, you know, essentially bring, bring down the network or, or force a huge um, leap in investment. But our, our belief is that, you know, decision makers will uh, be, you know, sort of thoughtful in, in, in where to use it and, and it'll be probably somewhere, uh, you know, in, in an area where, where it's an available resource but, but you wouldn't use it all day, every day um, j just uh, be because it would be extremely resource consumptive. But anyway, this, this just gives a matrix of what that looks like. Um, Randy, since Gary's from the city and county of Denver and uh, he's the only one on the phone, we might take this opportunity to just ask, Gary, have you guys set policies around this? Are you guys still working, figuring that out or? So from a video perspective, we only allow sergeants and above to have the opportunity to view in a mobile setting right now and obviously we're right in the in the midst of deploying right now, so it's it's still new to us. So we're not looking at any any streaming back to the commanders, any live body camera video right now. So a if if there was a situation where there may have been a use of force complaint or something, the sergeant would then have access to go to that officer's video in the field, but otherwise everything is going to be uploaded once the camera gets back to a physical docking station. Okay. Right. okay. And that, that, seems, and that seems pretty much, you know, from, from what I've seen, that, that's, you know, pretty much the way, uh, you know, people are thinking about, about uh, uh, body cams today. And so I guess the question is, and it makes absolute sense because you'd be crushed in terms of both the cost and the complexity and, you know, to, to to um, to stream a, a you know a ton of content, but I, I guess the question is you know as you think about the future, um, do you see you know five or ten or fifteen years from now um, potentially a, um, a different policies or different use cases? Well, I'm I'm sure that's there's going to be you know a lot of discussion of how that evolves over the years. Absolutely. Huh. It, and uh, I, oh, go ahead, Randy. Oh yeah, no, no, no. Go ahead, Kim. Kim. No, I was just going to suggest maybe Gary will check in with you this time next year and just kind of understand how you guys have see, things see played out. If if your um, policy morphed through the years, it was really deployed and matured, or or use of it um, increased, and uh, just get an understanding for our own, really, frankly, alternative planning too, if that's okay. Sure. Okay. Did you have any other questions on the the section Randy just covered? No. Okay. Thank you, Randy. I really appreciate it. Okay, good. So we're almost done, Gary. The last um, piece is really we just stepped you quickly through the incident data that we uh, used. Uh, this is a list of the agencies that participated. Um, and uh, we actually were able to get data from the Colorado State Patrol, which was helpful because not only did they provide incidents for state agencies, the patrol, parks and wildlife, transportation, correction, revenue, but they also uh, gave us information about uh, around some um, federal organizations, BLM and Forest Service. And then uh, in the northwest part of the state and the San Luis Valley, they um, actually dispatch for local agencies. So we had the benefit for two um, decent sized areas to get information on local response as well. And so the blue represents the state patrol data, the green represents local agency data, and this is really just kind of a, a colored analysis of the data we showed you previously. So our next steps um, that, and uh, just doesn't necessarily apply to you, I think Ed's working back still through Scott's office, but uh, Scott Field, I mean, but we'll be stepping through these uh, at a county 
um, or agency level. Um, and then we will supply the GIS files that signals um, aggregated if the agencies are interested. Uh, we'll also, it just doesn't apply to you, the data collection, the CAD data, I'll be working back with Athena's group um, because we still want that CAD data. And again, we'll be using it, I think, largely to look at um, capacity in the, in the metro area. And uh, we really consider this an ongoing negotiation with FirstNet, and we do expect 2016 to be busy. Um, we are really going to look, as you heard in the conversation at the PSCS a few weeks ago, we're going to look heavily at um, the alternative RAN planning, and I think um, people like yourself and your agency are going to be critical in, in figuring that out. So that's all we have. All Did you right. have any other questions? No. No, we got a long way to go, but uh, I think this is a great start. Um, I'm glad we're, you know, thankful to you, you and the team for the response that uh, was made to FirstNet because I, I think a lot of these states are just hanging out waiting to see where we're being proactive the other way, you know, kind of giving them some ideas. So. Yeah, I have to say, I think they were um, shocked and um Paul's not the right word, but shocked and I think rattled by the amount of data that, and really, you know, our thanks and credit to 